This is Pastor Mike Hargard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. This is part four in our final part on the case for a perfect Bible. Now, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out with a question that either someone has asked you or they've made a statement like, well, I use the King James, but it's a translation and no translation can be inspired. Either someone has said that to you or you have said that yourself. Uh, a lot of good Bible-believing Christians, born-again people, um, will have this question in their mind. It's not necessarily wrong, evil. It's not a mark that you're lost and going to burn in hell if you even ask this question in your mind, because I have. Uh, my testimony is that I grew up in this church. Uh, the room I'm in now used to be a nursery, all right, back in the day. Um, and maybe in some cases, it still is. Uh, but anyway, I grew up with a King James Bible in this church. First Bible I ever had was a King James. Uh, the Bible that my mom, this is it right here, my mom bought for me when I surrendered to preach, age 16, uh, is a King James Bible. And back during that time in the 70s and in the 80s, the new translations really had not made a lot of inroads uh, into the churches. And so most of the churches in, in America were using a King James, but the transition was just starting to take over. And uh, it never was really a question here. In fact, um, when I was about 16, 17, 18 years old, uh, I, with some other people in our church, we started reading some of the uh, literature put out by Chick Publications. And it just really solidified in us that this Bible's right and everything it says and all these new translations were perversions. But then, I went to Bible college, went to two of them. And in the course of three years, the devil took me from the solid rock to the shifting sand of Bible correcting, Bible doubting, uh, textual criticism, um, going to other translations, or believing that this translation was no different than any others in respect that it had mistakes in it. And I was even arguing with a guy, because we don't have original manuscripts, how can you tell whether or not this book is right? If we were able to compare this book with the original manuscripts, then maybe we could understand and know. But God always, see that was my thinking, but God always has a better way to show things to us. So my testimony is in 1997, I had been a pastor of this church for a year. God led me into, let's study Bible prophecy, Mike. Okay, great. Let's go get some Bible prophecy books from the Bible prophecy bookstore. And God said, no, you're going to read the Bible. I wrote a book of prophecy. Wow, that's amazing. So I just started reading the Bible. But at that time, I still had that Bible college training in me that I could, on any given verse, go back to the original Greek or Hebrew, make it say whatever I wanted to say. Um, and when you do that, you're going to ruin a Bible prophecy understanding. And so it wasn't until through a series of thoughts, and I can remember it as plain as day, the series and the trail of thoughts that God was leading me down one day as I was meditating on His Word, thinking on these things. And I surrendered that day to the Holy Ghost leading me to believe that this Bible is perfect in everything that it says. Study it, read it, pray over it, memorize it, but believe the words that are in this book. And God even convicted me um, I, was, I was just starting to count things in the Bible and started just starting to see patterns in the Bible. And I wanted to know what the 70th chapter of the Bible was. Seven for completion and perfection. Ten for dominion. Seven times ten. That's Exodus 20. 70th chapter of the Bible is Exodus 20. If you don't know what's in Exodus 20, I'm to turn there. Once you get a Bible out, turn there or go to purebiblesearch.com. Download our free software for Linux, Mac, Windows, and install it. 
and you find the 70th chapter of the Bible. It's real easy. You click a couple things, they'll take you right to it. It's Exodus 20. It's where the Ten Commandments are. Ten for dominion. Seven, because the record that God sent down with Moses, the written record, was perfect and complete. No additions, nothing taken away from it. 70th chapter of the Bible. And the very first verse <clears throat> just incidentally has seven words in English, and God spake all these words saying. Now that's cool, to me that's cool, but one day I was reading this and the Holy Ghost said, Mike, stop right here. See, it was the Holy Ghost came up with that, not me. Mike, stop right here. God spake all these words saying. And the Holy Ghost said, Mike, do you believe that? What are you getting at? You're reading your English King James 1611 Bible. Do you believe that what follows verse one came that God spake all of those words in your language. And I paused. And the only answer that I could come up with was, yeah, it has to be. We keep calling this God's word. And yet when it comes to the words that are in here, we don't like what they say, so we go change it. We are changing God's word. God did God, here's the question. Did God speak all these words? The answer is either yes or no. And it's that simple. You've got to settle in your mind as you're reading your English translated Bible. Did God speak all of those words? And if he did, then it is wrong, it is illegal for you to trifle with these words, to change them, to diminish aught from them, or add anything to them. It is wrong for us to do that if these are, in fact, God's words, every single one of them. And I believe that they are. I believe that they have to be. And so, what I'm saying is, in 1998, when the Holy Spirit led me to believe that this Bible was perfect. I surrendered to that, but we don't, just, we don't just walk in blind faith. There is knowledge and understanding and wisdom that follows that faith, and it goes in that order. If you don't believe what the Bible says, then you're not going to get the knowledge, understanding, and wisdom from the Bible. You're going to get it from you, or you're going to get it from some other source, but you're not going to get it from the Bible. But if you believe what these words are saying, and if you believe every one of these are the words of God, then God will then give you knowledge, He will give you understanding, and you'll get wisdom from it. So, when God, when I surrendered to that, God then started supplying the evidence. Now, I'm not a textual uh, manuscript person. I don't spend hours every week poring over Greek and Hebrew manuscripts, finding out where they came from, finding out what catalog ID they have, finding out how this one differs from that one. I'm not the expert on manuscripts. For me, it's a much simpler case that we can lay out. I'm not going to try to give you all the knowledge of the manuscripts and how this set of manuscripts is in fact superior to this set of manuscripts. There are people who are doing that and doing a great job, but that's not me. To me, the proof whether or not this Bible is the very words of God, the proof is in what it says. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to examine what it says about itself, and then you have to decide whether or not those words were in fact God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, all scripture is this. Script means it's been written down, put in a book. This book is where we must get our doctrine. It is where our reproofs come from. If you want to win an argument with me, if you disagree with me on, on some issue, something I said, something I believe or don't believe, then you bring me 20 scriptures and you just start throwing them at me like darts, okay? 20, 25 scripture, 30 scripture, 100 scripture that says exactly what you said. Don't give me scriptures that do not say, for instance, if you say, 
Oh, let's see, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but sometimes you can't avoid that. If you want to say the earth is flat, if you want to believe the earth is flat, believe the earth is flat. If you want to believe that the Bible tells you the earth is flat, I can't help you. But if you want me to believe it, show me two verses in the Bible where God said the earth was flat. And that's, and I mean the earth is flat. Because I've watched the videos, I've read the websites, and I know how they do it. Since there is no verse, especially two, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Since there is no verse in the Bible that plainly, sta plainly states that the earth is flat, what people do then is they pull all these other verses and they extrapolate ideas out of it. But that's, that's different than the Bible speaking. It's the difference between you speaking on behalf of the Bible or the Bible speaking for itself. See the difference? If you speak on behalf of the Bible, then you're going to say things that the Bible, for some reason, has a problem saying. And you're going to help everybody out with it. And yet, I believe that the Bible speaks for itself, and it doesn't need our help, especially to interpret it. So, I can be reproved by scriptures, by the Word of God. And I have. I've changed a lot of things in the way I think over the years. First time I was ever introduced to geocentricity, a guy sent me a book. I didn't read the book except I read the scriptures. They were all from the King James that the man supplied in the book. So I believe exactly what the Bible says in every word. And if the Bible doesn't plainly say it, why do people make a big mess out of something that they believe when in fact the Bible doesn't plainly teach it? So if we're going to believe, if we're going to be reproved, it must be, we must be reproved by the words of God. If we're going to be corrected, must be corrected by the words of God. If we're going to be instructed in righteousness and Believe it or not, everybody's got their own form of righteousness. Well, I think that's right. Well, I think what you did is wrong. And everybody's got an opinion on everybody else's life. But the thing is, is something that you're doing or something somebody else is doing wrong according to what, what our current morals and ideas of life are? Or, it took me a long time to say that, or is something wrong based upon what the Bible says. Okay? For instance, people are now coloring their hair in weird colors. Okay? Now, I don't particularly care for that. When I see, you know, young people, their hair all purple and pink and green and stuff like that. I don't really, I don't really like that. Is it wrong? Is it wrong according to the book that instructs us in righteousness? No. The Bible doesn't say anything about it. We may not like it. We may think that it's a sign of rebellion or something like that, or it may just be foolishness, but the Bible does not restrict hair color. It says nothing about it. So if we're going to receive instruction in righteousness, if you're going to say, Pastor Mike, you're doing this wrong and I don't like it, we must be corrected by the scriptures. That's where our righteousness comes from. Now. All of these things that I've laid out for you, I've been using a word here, plainly. And that is, if we're going to believe something, the Bible must make it plain, very simple, non-ambiguous. It must say exactly what it wants to say, and then we are required to believe exactly what it says. Let me give an example, 2 Corinthians 3.12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Meaning that the Bible says it a certain way, and it means exactly what it says. The, the follow-up to this verse here, uh, in verse 13, and not as Moses. Moses was hard of speech. We, we believe that he was a stutterer. Sometimes I am. Um, 
Isaiah 28 and 11, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. I believe the stammering lips was Moses, and another tongue, of course, was Greek, uh, that what the New Testament was written in, all right? But that's my, that's my opinion, that's my theory, that's what I believe, all right? Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And I started this whole series out with, where do we get our doctrine on the deity of Christ? We get it from the plain statements of the Word of God. Where do we get our doctrine on blood atonement? We get it from the plain statements in the Word of God. And so, my point here is, is that what we believe must be made plain to us so that even children can understand it, even the simple-minded can understand it. And my point in this context is, if the Bible is only the real um, inerrant Word of God, if that alone is the Word of God in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, tongues that we don't understand, then when it is read to us in those languages, that is not great plainness of speech because we don't have a clue what that person just said. We don't have, we have no idea what they just said. And so let me show you some other verses that talk about the plainness of God's Word. Habakkuk 2.2, 2, the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Psalm 27, 11, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Proverbs 8, 8 and 9, all the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understandeth and write to them that find knowledge. Proverbs 15, 19, look at this one. The way of the slothful man is in hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. Isaiah 32, 4, the heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly. So that's what we were just talking about with Moses, all right? And I want you to get this. God specifically chose Moses because he was a stammerer, because he was hard of speech, and people had a hard time understanding Moses. Think about what that means. What that means is, is that every time, and Paul says this plainly, every time the Jews read the Old Testament, they don't understand it. They don't get it. There's a veil over their eyes, and they cannot see. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. God has deliberately, partially blinded Israel, because when they read the Old Testament, they don't understand who the rock is, who the lamb is. They don't understand who these prophets are and, what's, and wh whose spirit is in them. They do not understand who it was that was in their burning bush. They don't understand who it was that was in the fiery furnace. They have no idea who that is. But when we read the New Testament, because Paul uses great plainness of speech and not as Moses, when we read the New Testament, now we can go back and see all of these types and shadows and all these symbols and all these pictures that God embedded into the Word, and we understand them now. We know that that rock that followed Israel, we know beyond any doubt that that rock was Christ. You see how plain that understanding is. Uh, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That verse is quoted by children as young as four and five years old. And it's great plainness of speech. You want to be saved? God sent forth His Son to you. See how plain that is? And if it was in Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic, we wouldn't understand what it was. But God is laying down this idea that God blesses people by giving them plainness of speech and plainness of understanding. Let me, let me read this verse again. The way of the righteous is made plain. This book is our instruction in righteousness, and we can read it plainly. We know exactly what it says. Now, I want to go back to Mr. Daniel Wallace. The esteemed doctor of Dallas Theological Seminary, who calls himself a conservative, calls himself a, I guess, maybe a fundamentalist or whatever, but the truth is, he doesn't get it. And he has decided to pull his beliefs about the Bible from some other source than the Bible. And if you were to ask him, do you believe that any translation could be the inspired Word of God? 
if he's going to be honest, which I think he will be, he will say, absolutely not. No translation can be the inerrant, inspired Word of God. How do I know that? Let's look at what he said. In all particulars, only the original Greek and Hebrew text can be regarded as the Word of God. Something is always lost in translation. Always. Scholars are not sure of the exact words of Jesus. Ancient historians were concerned to get the gist of what someone said, but not necessarily the exact wording. In truth, though red letter editions of the Bible may give comfort to believers that they have the very words of Jesus in every instance, this is a false comfort. Daniel, you're a liar. And the Bible says you're a liar. What he said. Scholars are not sure of the exact words of Jesus. Ancient historians were concerned to get the gist of what someone said, but not necessarily the exact wording. Excuse me, Mr. Wallace. I, I thought someone as esteemed and knowledgeable as you would not know this. The fact that those men who wrote the four Gospels were not writing them from memory. They were not writing those words from their heart. They were not writing those words from some other source that got it wrong. They were writing the words of Jesus Christ given to them by the Holy Spirit of God, not by some historic book, not by Q. If you've ever gone to Bible college or seminary, you know what that is. Okay, look at the letter Q. There's this theory that says the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they're similar, it is obvious to us that they must have gotten their source stories and their words from a document called Q, the letter Q. I don't know why it's Q, but it's Q. Because, and that document no longer exists. So they say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all stole their stuff from a document that no longer exists. That is not what the Bible says. The Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Mr. Wallace lied to you. He says, in the truth, though red letter editions, the Bible may give comfort to believers that they have the very words of Jesus in every instance. This is a false comfort. That's a lie. It's not true. And then his claim that the Bible can only be in the original Greek and Hebrew. That also is a lie. And it's not going to be my wit against Mr. Wallace's wit. It's not going to be my t intelligence or lack thereof. It's going to be his intelligence. Okay, or his intelligence. It's not going to be either one. It's going to be the Word of God versus both of us. The Word of God is the one that's supposed to settle the issue in our mind. Is what he said is right or is what I'm saying is right? So, oh, here's something else he said too. Why I do not think the King James Bible is the best translation available today. First, I want to affirm with all evangelical Christians that the Bible is the Word of God, inerrant, inspired, and our final authority for faith and life. Let me stop right here. Now, we already know what he means by the word Bible. And it's not this. It's not this book that we all carry around in Sunday school. In his mind, the Bible, being the inerrant Word of God, is in the original Greek and Hebrew manuscripts, which don't exist. And the copies that we have, you couldn't read them anyway. So, where do we go? If we can't read Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, and if we can't understand the words, how are we going to know what God said? That's a setup for, you must get it from the priest. Or you must get it from the bishop or the pastor. You must get it from the Bible scholars. But you, personally, cannot get it from the Bible. It's a lie. Okay? Anyway. He says, however, nowhere in the Bible am I told that only one translation of it is the correct one. Now, let me stop right here and let me reassert this. I am not King James only. And there are several def def definitions for that. I believe that God translated his word into English in the form of this Bible right here. I also believe that the Holy Ghost aided the translation into other languages. And all of those other language translations, the good ones, they all came from the same vine. Remember that teaching. There's the, vine, the true vine of Christ and there's the vine of Sodom. And hence we have two manuscript lines. The majority text from where the Textus Receptus, which is what the King James is translated from, or 
the Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus line of manuscripts that came out of the Vatican. They were corrupted. They don't agree with themselves. Thousands and thousands of places. This is the vine of Sodom. And a Bible that's translated from the pure, true vine of Christ, Texas Receptus, even, even translating from the King James Bible. I don't have a problem with that at all. Okay? So what he's saying is, however, nowhere in the Bible am I told that only one translation uh, of it is the correct one. He's setting up something that I don't believe, and he's setting up what they call a straw man. A straw man is like a fake argument, making it look like that's what we all believe, but the truth is, I only believe what the Bible says concerning translated words of God. And I'll show you what I believe from the scripture. I believe translated words of God are still the words of God. If God said them, if God translated them, then they are the words of God. And just because there is a difference in the way we speak in English and the way someone speaks in Greek, it's still the same. I'll give you an example. Okay, when we walk into a room, there's a greeting that we give to people, you know, amongst common people. We say, How's it going? Okay, the Canadians add a to it. How's it going, eh? Okay, and what that means is we're not asking everybody for their life story and to tell us all their miseries. It's a simple form of greeting that we give amongst common people. How's it going, eh? Okay, what's going on? What's up? Okay, in Spanish they say, que pasa? Which means what passes? Well, in English that can mean a lot of different things. But the idea is, whether it's que pasa or how's it going, eh? They both mean the exact same thing. The words mean a, a greeting, a, an informal greeting amongst common people, que pasa. In English, it's still an informal greeting amongst common people. It's the same thing. And God, and only God, is the one who can bring his words into someone's language and cause them to understand it. I'm going to show you from the Bible, all right? Anyway, nowhere am I told that the King James Bible is the best or only Holy Bible. There is no verse that tells me how God will preserve his word. That's not true. So I can have no scriptural warrant for arguing that the King James has exclusive rights to the throne. The arguments must proceed on other bases. What he's, what he's setting up for you is, I believe that the Bible doesn't teach us one way or the other whether we can believe that we now currently have the perfect Word of God in our translation. He's setting up the idea that since I'm telling you the Bible doesn't teach you anything about that, then we must go to people like me to tell you what it says. So he says, all of us have a tendency to make mountains out of molehills and then set up fortresses in those mountains. We often cling to things out of emotion rather than out of true piety. And as such, we do a great disservice to a dying world that is desperately in need of a clear, strong proclaim voice proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mr. Wallace, if the word that that gospel comes from is not correct, then that gospel is not correct. And if you give them a gospel that is not correct, it won't save them. Simply put, it's another gospel. So, can a translation be trusted. Let's go to the scriptures. Isaiah 28, 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Verse 11 is the key. For with stammering lips, I think that's Moses, and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing that yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. So God, number one, this is a prophecy against the Jews, Israel. Because, oh, they worship Moses. Oh, they praise Moses and praise Father Abraham. And yet Moses was a stammerer. And the Jews are so Jewish that they don't accept anything from the Goyim. 
the Gentiles. Those filthy, nasty, dirty dogs, the Gentiles. They don't accept anything from them. And yet God told them through Isaiah. Isaiah has 66 chapters. Isaiah is a prototype of the whole book of the Bible. God told them through the prophet Isaiah, I'm going to speak another language. I'm speaking through stammering lips right now through Moses, and you don't understand it. But I'm going to speak through another language. And because I'm going to do that, I'm going to cause you to fall. And I'm going to raise up a people who are no people. I'm going to raise up a different type of people. I want to raise up the Gentiles. And they are going to be my people because they believe what I said. You don't. And that's, that's the signal that God is sending to Israel. So, God has established that he speaks through stammering lips, Old Testament, and through another language. And I'll just simply put it. All the places in the New Testament, let's just say the Greek, let's say the original Greek, all the places in the New Testament where it, where it uh, recites or quotes the Old Testament, you will notice that they are written differently. If you'll, if you'll compare New Testament quotes of Old Testament verses with the actual Old Testament verses, you will notice that there is differences and how they're said. And if you understand Greek and Hebrew, when you compare the original Greek quotation from the Old Testament with the Old Testament Hebrew itself, you will note that there are differences in how it's said. And yet, those Greek words in your Greek New Testament, quoting the Old Testament, they are still the inspired, inerrant Word of God. God has already established through this one thing that the quotations in the New Testament are 100% correct, even though they are translations of the original. I'll give you an example of how the Greek in the New Testament actually adds to and aids the understanding of the Hebrew. You remember when Jesus, and I'm just kind of going from memory so I don't have the verses, you can look them up. Remember when Jesus was uh, in the wilderness being tempted. And Satan offered him, he said, why don't you turn these stones to bread? And Jesus said, it is written, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. You'll notice in your King James that that phrase, every word of God, is written out plainly and none of it is in italics. If you go and look in, it's in the book of Deuteronomy. If you go look in Deuteronomy, that same where Jesus was quoting from, you will notice that it says, but by every word of God, you'll notice that part of that is in italics, meaning that some of those words were not written verbatim in the original Hebrew. And yet, when Jesus was quoting it, he quoted it and said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word word of God. Where the Old Testament didn't supply it, the Greek New Testament filled it in. So even though the Greek and the Hebrew don't say the exact 100% same thing, they don't contradict one another, they complement one another. That passage in Isaiah where, it, no, no, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read it, no one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. And even in a marriage, we always refer to our wives as the better half. Why? Because she supplies for us what we're severely lacking in, okay? And vice versa. We can program the VCR. We can pro VCR. We can program the, uh, the DVR. We can do things on a computer that a wife can't do. I mean, we can do all these things. We can fix cars. And what I'm saying is, it's just like the Bible. The Bible, even though it's in Greek and Hebrew in the originals, they complement one another. And I'm going to show you an example of that, okay? Uh, in fact, let me do this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I have this verse. Uh, we'll put it up on the screen. It's coming later on. But I want to get to it now. Because when Isaiah said, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, Paul quoted that in Isaiah chapter 14, at verse 21, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. Whoa! What Paul said in Greek doesn't match word for word what was written in Hebrew. So is Paul wrong? Is there an error that a copyist made concerning Paul's words? Or did Paul say exactly what the Holy Ghost told him to say? 
And what we have here between Isaiah 28, 11 and 1 Corinthians 14, 21 is the complete picture of what God was saying. He said it this way in Hebrew. He said it this way in Greek. And we're to understand exactly what God said by way of both of those verses. And one of them is not in the original Hebrew. It's translated into Greek. Okay? So anyway, God said that he would speak in another tongue. That would be a Gentile language. God always had it. In his mind, he told the prophets that he was going to speak. Instead of speaking to Israel, he's going to go speak to the Gentiles. And they'll believe what God said. How do you speak to Gentiles? You speak in their language. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was written therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. In Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 1, he said, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go and speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. For thou art not sent to a people of strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. So watch this. I love this. A hand comes down from heaven. It's got a roll of a book in it. And Ezekiel's going, look at that. And God says, take this roll and eat it. It's going to be in your mouth, sweet as honey. So he did. The Bible tastes like manna, manna tastes like honey. All right, sweet. I love it. Then he says, now that you've eaten my book, I want you to take these words that are in you, and I want you to go into the house of Israel. I don't want you to go to the Gentiles, whose language that you don't even speak. I want you to go to Israel, but they won't listen to you. However, if you had gone to the Gentiles in these other languages, they would listen to you. But Israel won't, all right? There is a New Testament companion, a mate, to this passage right here. It's awesome. Look at this. Revelation chapter 7. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and what? Tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. So we see right here, gathered around the throne of God is not just the Jews. It's people of different languages, people of different tongues. How did they get there? God spoke to them in their tongue, in their language. Now, Revelation 10. Remember Ezekiel? Hand comes down from heaven, it's got a book in it. And Ezekiel's told to eat it, tastes like honey. And I want you to go to Israel, not to the Gentiles in their language. I want you to go to Israel. That was the Old Testament version of it. Here's the New Testament version of it. In Revelation chapter 10, a mighty angel comes down from heaven. He has a book in his hand. Watch this. Verse 9, I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the, the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. Same thing with Ezekiel. Same thing with Ezekiel. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Now stop right here. Look at this. Now, now there's a difference. You see it? But in both cases, Ezekiel and John, they were told to eat the book and that it would taste like honey. But something else is added with John's version of it. When it hits your belly, it's going to be bitter. It's going to make you sick. Okay? You see? You see? Oh, I love this. They don't contradict one another. They complement one another. You're getting a fuller picture now of how this works. Verse 10, And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, and nations, and tongues, and kings. One, two, three, four. It's just like the four Gospels. And back, back in Revelation 7, 
It was all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues who heard Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. So let's get back to Revelation. John was told to eat the book, taste like honey, be bitter in his belly. But in this case, John is not told to go to the Hebrew-speaking Israelites, the Jews. He said, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And what do we have now? We have the book of Revelation translated into the tongues of the Gentile nations so that they can read it plainly for themselves. You see the, you see the contrast. Ezekiel, eat this book, take it to Israel. They're not going to believe it. John, take this book, eat it, go to the Gentiles. They will believe it. Okay? See how those two are mated together? See how one complements the other? You see how by seeing both of these, it's just like using both of your eyes to look upon an object. You're getting the full and complete picture of what that really is. And in this case, John was told to go to the Gentiles in their languages. This book translated into their language. Malachi chapter 1 verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name in a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. Look at that. Matthew 12, 18. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment or shew judgment to the Gentiles. Matthew 12, 21, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Luke 2, 32, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. You see, God's interested in saving Israel. I believe that. But he's also interested in saving the Gentiles, giving the Gentiles the gospel. How? In their tongues so that they can understand it. What? God gave the Israelites his word to them in their language, and they didn't accept it. So the question is, why wouldn't God give the gospel to us in our language? Because we will accept it. God knew this all along. This is not some afterthought, and this is not something that I created out of thin air, and I'm trying to make the Bible say it. God is telling you in plain English, see, plain English, that he always intended to save the Gentiles because of the foolishness of Israel. Isaiah 45, 23, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Stop right here. The New Testament quotes that verse, but it doesn't say swear, it says confess. Which one's right? Which one, are these contradictory to one another? Well, that's the translation. And see, you can't translate it from, from the Hebrew language. It won't translate. So it must be wrong. And yet, it's in our Bibles. And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Holy men of God spake as ever moved by the Holy Ghost. So is it every tongue shall swear or every tongue shall confess? Yes. It's both of them. The Bible is not showing you that they contradict. The Bible is showing you that they complement. Every one of these is mated with the other perfectly, perfectly matched. And only God can do that right. It's his word after all. Isaiah 50 verse 4, The Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning, he wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. God gave the translators of this Bible the tongue of the learned, so they would know how to speak a word in season. Acts chapter 11, verse 1. The apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Stop right here. Daniel Wallace wants you to believe that the word of God is written in a language that you can't understand. That's what he wants you to believe. And yet, right here, the Gentiles received the word of God. Big whoop, right? If it was in a language that they didn't understand. Hebrew. 
The Gentile Greeks didn't understand Hebrew. The, the Jews were speaking Greek at this time. How did they receive the Word of God? They had it translated into their language, and they received it. But to give somebody a book in a different language, like give to me the, the sayings of Confucius written in Chinese. Oh, that might, it, I like how Chinese words look. I think they're pretty. I can't understand one of them. So what good would it do for me to gain some wisdom from the writings of Confucius if they were all in Chinese and I don't know Chinese? By the way, I don't really follow Confucius, don't know anything about what he said, other than what I saw in the fortune cookie. So anyway, don't write me a letter saying, he's going to follow Confucius. No, I'm not. But you understand what I'm saying. If you give me an Old Testament written in Hebrew and say, this will save your soul. How? Just by having it? Or do I have to read it first? And I don't read Hebrew. God made provision that we would receive the Word of God in our language. Acts 15, 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. 2 Timothy 4, 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. See, I mean, hear it again. saying over and over and over again the same thing. The Gentiles are going to hear and believe. The Gentiles are going to hear it. How? It's in their language. When Paul went to preach to all these Gentiles all over the Roman Empire, he wasn't speaking Hebrew to them. He was speaking their language. Whatever the language that was, probably Greek, maybe Latin, I don't know, but it's probably Greek. Paul was speaking their language to them, the words of God. How did God give him that power? Acts chapter 2, verse 4. The day of Pentecost is God speaking Gentile languages. God speaking His Word through the apostles in their language. God is the translator. God's the best. Tra God is the one who invented all the languages, right? Tower of Babel. How many languages are there on the planet? 150, 200 languages? 250? I don't know. God, just like that, invented every one of them and put them into the minds of every one of those people, and they had no idea what one another was speaking. It was confusion because they didn't know the what? The tongue of the other person. And yet here, and that was a curse, and yet here God is lifting the curse of the unknown tongue for us Gentiles so that we can understand plainly what God has to say to us. You see, when I pray to God, I pray in English. It's the only language I know. My son-in-law told me that when he prays to God, it's in Swahili, because Swahili is a far easier language for him. It's a language of his birth, far easier language for him than English. I hear him talk to his mom and his grandma. They still live in Kenya. And when he's talking to them, I have no idea what he's saying, okay? And sometimes it sounds like he's angry talking to his mom and his grandma, but I know he's not. He's speaking Swahili to them, maybe Luo, because that's the language that he grew up in. And to think that God would want to save us and yet not give us his word and give us that gospel in our language. You did not memorize <clears throat> John 3.16 in the original Greek. Neither does your pastor. Your pastor does not know by memory John 3, 16, Romans 10, 9, and 10, Romans 3, 23, Romans 6, 23, 1 John 1, 9. He does not know those verses in Greek. He knows them in English. And if he says that the English Bible is not the inspired Word of God, and yet he uses English Bible verses to lead people to Christ, he's contradicting himself. Because either those words are inspired and they save men's souls, and the Holy Ghost is working through those words to lead men to Christ, or if they're not the inspired Word of God, how can these people be inspired by the Holy Ghost to believe it? So on the day of Pentecost, those men were speaking the translated Word of God to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 2, verse 4, And they were filled, all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
In verse 7, they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus and Asia, in Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. The very beginning of the church age started with a translated Bible in their language. Why is it different now? Why is it that God started the church in a language that they could understand? Not just Greek either. All of these different languages, 17 of them here, all of these different languages that they're speaking. And yet now we're to believe that the real inerrant word of God is in a mystery language that you and I will never understand. It's not right. And that is not what God said. So in Isaiah 28, 11, let's go back and compare these now. Isaiah 28, 11, with stammering lips and another tongue, will he speak to this people? 1 Corinthians 14, 21, in the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. It went from in Isaiah to God speaking one other language other than Hebrew to by the time Paul got it, now God is speaking many other tongues and other lips to this people. Bible, two verses now, are telling you that God's word would go forth in other languages as given by the Holy Spirit himself. Do you believe that God translates his word? Do you believe that? Remember I said to you earlier about the differences in Greek and Hebrew. What about those differences in other languages? Let me show you two verses, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Which one of these is the inspired word of God? Because they both say something different. They both are. One's Joel chapter 2 verse 32 and one's Acts chapter 2 verse 21 both of them from the same King James Bible. One says delivered, one says saved. Are they contradictory? Are they competing against one another? No, what it really means is delivered. No, what it really means is saved. It means both of them. The Holy Ghost is putting them together for you. Even though it is different in different languages, it is still the same word of God. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and see what the Holy Ghost told Paul to say concerning whether or not our Bibles are translated. And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification, which means that they're all distinct and different from one another. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Now, you apply that to the Bible translation issue. Daniel Wallace said, God never said anything about translating the Bible in different languages. God never said anything about one perfect Bible and the rest of them are puke and junk. Of course, I'm characterizing Daniel Wallace. But according to Daniel Wallace, the Bible is silent on the issue of translations. But it's not silent. Paul made it very clear that if I utter words to you in another language, how in the world are you going to understand what I'm saying? If I give you words in an unknown tongue that you never speak, how can it be known what is piped or harped? And if a trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall, how shall we know, you know to prepare himself for battle? You understand that, right? Military upon military for thousands of years used a trumpet or even drum beats 
to announce certain things about a battle. There was a, tr there was a retreat, there was a charge, there was probably a, a trumpet sound to you know, move and go this direction or go that direction or whatever. And it's been done for thousands of years. Even the American military, we, you know, you hear that. What that is, is get up boys, we're going to go fight a battle. And all the boys knew that. So Paul's saying, if we don't know what's been trumpeted, how can we prepare ourselves to battle? And folks, if you're like me, you do battle just about every day. And the only way that I can win the battle against my enemy is that I know the sound of the Lord's voice. And I know that trumpet gives a certain sound. So let's follow it up with this from 1 Corinthians 14. And then you take this, you meditate on it, you pray over it, and you ask God, is what I said right? Can my translated Bible be the perfect, inerrant, inspired, translated Word of God? Can it be? 1 Corinthians 14, 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most three, and that by course, and let one interpret. Now, you say, well, that's like unknown tongues in the church. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, God giving words to people in other languages and then, you know, someone giving the interpretation. Yeah, I know. Well, it doesn't mean the Bible. No, it says if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three. Any man, including Christ. It's his word, right? Let it be by two or at the most three and that by course. Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Three unknown tongues interpreted by one book. That's God's method. That's how God laid the rules down. God does not alter from his position and from his ways. If God says it, he's going to perform it. And if God says that if someone comes reading Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, then they are a barbarian to you. And those tongues must be translated. All right, let's apply it then to like what a lot of Pentecostals do and what they were obviously doing back here. By the way, unknown tongues in the Bible, always known languages always known human languages. The Bible settled that issue. So let's say in this early church, then uh, a guy stood up and he's prophesying in Phrygian. Another person stands up and God is giving them this same prophecy in Egyptian. And then a third one rises up and God is giving them that same word in Greek. The Holy Ghost then would raise one person only to rise up and say in their language what these three men said. That's how the Holy Ghost did it. And if there be no interpretation, it's out of line. And you've been in churches where everybody's going, <laughs> no interpretation, not one. And it wasn't in order. It wasn't by course. It was everybody on a big pile going, oh, blah, 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 blah. That's confusing. God's not in that. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's not what the Bible says. These people that do this, they've gotten their doctrine from some other source. They didn't get it from the Bible because if they had, and I know Pentecostal churches that do it exactly this way. One stands up, gives a tongue. Another stands up, gives a tongue. Another stands up, gives a tongue. And it's never a woman. Never, ever, ever. Because in the same chapter, Paul said, let the women keep silent. And then, after that's been done, in, by course, in order, one stands up and gives the one interpretation of that. Now, but the, after he does, there isn't a second man jumped up and says, well, original, what, what this guy really said was something different. Because that is also confusion. You see what I'm getting at? 
you bring everybody in the church bringing a King James Bible to church and everybody's reading the same verses and yet the guy in the pulpit saying it doesn't really say that I'm gonna alter the one interpretation and I'm gonna provide an alternate inter interpretation and I'm gonna tell you that I think the King James is wrong in the way they translated it you hear that every Sunday you hear it you hear you've heard it for years because your pastor went to seminary or he was trained by someone that way. And that's what he does. Always, always changing the interpretation. But the simple fact of the matter is, God swore that he would translate the unknown tongues into the tongue that you can understand. Do you need the preacher to tell you what the Bible says? No. You need the Holy Ghost to tell you what the Bible says in your language. Amen? Or else, let's just go join the Vatican and let the Pope tell us what we have to believe. And I'm not going to do that. 